Oh, we were. <laughs> the other night, and we were laying down those tracks, and then that's all fun. And then you go in the room, and they start playing it back, and then they isolate your voice. And so when I left, I went, well, I can check that off the list as something I cannot do. <laughs> but it's great anyway. So, uh, you know, we are talking about last week and continuing on today about the subject of love, and, and specifically God's love for us. And so I wanted to talk to you this morning about the topic of undeserving love. I read a story years ago. Uh, have you ever heard of the baseball player by the name of Jackie Robinson? Uh, yeah, most of you have. Well, it, it, he was the first African-American uh, to play baseball in, into, the, into the major leagues. Uh, and he, uh, he, he broke baseball's color barrier, if you will. But he faced some, as you can imagine, some pretty hostile crowds in every stadium that he went to. So one day he was playing in his home stadium, Ebbets Field, there in Brooklyn, and he, uh, he, he committed an error. And the fans began to boo him and jeer at him and make fun of him. He stood there on second base, head down, humiliated, while the crowd incessantly continued to boo him. Well, without saying a word, I don't know how many of you remember, and, and, and I've, I've read about this guy, an incredible shortstop by the name of Pee Wee Reese. Anybody remember him? You're dating yourself, but yes, absolutely. He went over and stood next to Jackie Robinson, silently put his arm around him and faced the crowds. Suddenly, this very popular baseball player stood up for this one that everybody else hated and dismissed as awful. He stood next to him, put his arm next to him, stuck his chest out as if to say, you may not love him, but I do. <laughs> and I thought, what a great illustration of the love that Jesus has to us when we are so undeserving. Do you deserve it? Do you deserve it? Do I deserve it? Well, wait a minute. You know, there's people in this place here that has earned doctorates in all kinds of education. There are people here that have incredible uh, ability to love people and to do things. Doesn't that make it to where you deserve it? Well, unfortunately, the bar for deserving it is to be like Jesus and in that area we all fail but let me ask you this question have you ever been the one who messed up have you ever been the one that just blew it have you ever been the one in this when the crowds turned on you you ever you ever been the one who was on top of the pile and then all of a sudden messed up so bad that everybody that you thought loved you began to hate you ever been there have you ever been the one that needed someone to put their arm around you? I promise you there's people right here today that are leading defeated lives because they thought everything was going great and then the rug got ripped out from under them. There are people here who desperately need to experience love like Jesus gave. Uh, maybe you need that. Maybe you need that kind of love. Maybe you need to experience the love of Jesus, maybe for the first time or for the first time in a long time. Well, by the time that we finish this sermon this morning, it's my prayer, and I prayed for you just before I walked up on stage this morning. As Cheryl prayed for me, I prayed for you. I want every person in this room to be able to know and experience the love of God. Um, Look with me, if you will. Our text is going to be in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, and uh, we'll start reading at verse 1. I'm in the NIV. If you have a different translation, you find it hard uh, keeping up, um, my great guy up there in the booth, Brother Mark, will have it on the screen. But let's read it together, and let's see if we can see about uh, undeserving love that Jesus expresses here. Verse 1, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and, Jesus, and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, uh, and the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? Verse 6. They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, here's what he said, 
If any one of you is without sin, then let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? <laughs> and she says, No one, sir. And she says, Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. You know, it's interesting to note from this passage of Scripture that even when everybody else condemns you, even when everybody else puts you down, even when everybody else leaves you and forsakes you, don't have anything to do with you, Jesus still stands on top of second base put his arm around you with his chest stuck out and says, I don't care if you love him or not. I don't care if you love her or not. I do. We're going to look at that this morning. Let's pray. Father, we give you praise and we thank you, Lord, for all you do in our lives. But, Lord, thank you most of all for your undeserving love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. What an awful situation. Does anybody know that the woman did mess up? It wasn't like she maybe messed up. It wasn't like she... Somebody accused her of messing up. This woman was caught red-handed. I mean, she's messed up. I mean, not only is she not feeling the love anymore, she's literally in a battle, literally in a battle for her life because when they bring her to Jesus, the law says caught in adultery, get stoned. Caught in adultery, um, uh, the sin that leads to death. Caught in adultery, we're going to kill you. And then they go to Jesus, and they're going to already kill her anyway, but I think they've already put all this up. I mean, they've done all this on purpose so that they can trap Jesus. We're going to see that in just a minute. But, but, but she looks to the crowd for help, and none is to be found. And, you know, we're that way sometimes, aren't we? Something messes up in our lives, something we, we, we mess up, and then we go to our friends to help us, and they go, Johnny, I can't believe you would have done that. You're not who I thought you were. I don't want to have anything to do with you. You go to someone else that you've known all your life, and you go, man, I need some help. Well, I would help you, but what you've done is so bad, I don't want to have anything else to do to you and with you. And you go from person to person to person, to loved one, to loved one, to loved one, and they all say the same thing. You don't deserve my love. And then you go to Jesus, and Jesus says, you did what? I'm sorry, I don't love you either. No, wait. That's what she thought he was going to say. But instead, Jesus loves her. You know, there's something terribly wrong with this picture, and Jesus knows it. First, Jesus understands that this woman is being used by a pawn, as a pawn uh, by the Jewish people. <laughs> Do you know that Sometimes, you know, Jesus knows that sometimes good people do bad things. Good people mess up just like bad people do. But you also know that the Jews are not half as interested in keeping the law as they are in maintaining their status. They use the law as the vehicle to keep them where that they can have their fancy robes on and stand above other people and talk about how bad they are to make them look good. That's what they had in mind. And they were doing this to G with, with Jesus because as they went through the temple there, when they was going through the area, who was teaching? Jesus was teaching. Who was around him? The crowds. Who were they used to have? Uh, who, were they, who were they accustomed to having around them? All of those crowds around them talking about how great they are, bowing down to them, offering homage to them, listening to every word that they had to say. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes along and says, don't listen to them. What they say and what they do are two different things. Well, there's something wrong with this picture. I mean, it's not just a woman caught in, the, in, in a sin, and it's not just Jesus versus the religious leaders. I mean, it's more than this. I mean, the, 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 the religious leaders thought that you could earn heaven by being good and by your sinlessness and your obedience to the law. But Jesus came to show that none of us in ourselves are good enough, but only by this great love that God gave to us are we able to be sinned. I mean, aren't you glad that Jesus loves us that much? Aren't you glad that God decided to give the best he had to us so that we might have eternal life? Aren't you glad that as bad as you are and as bad as I am, that God has not even given up on us, but instead gave the best he had to us so that we can know eternal life? Aren't you glad that Jesus loves you? Three things about this passage right here, and we'll move forward. The first we see in this passage is that the Jews loved themselves more than they loved God. Sometimes we get into this situation because, you know, the you know, Bible tells us not to have any, anything, any images, any, anything above God. 
Well, sometimes we put ourselves in front of God. And that's what these Jewish people had done. I mean, these Jewish leaders were obviously doing all of this to discredit God so they could continue to do what they were doing. They acted as though they loved the law, but they, uh, but they were actually against it. They didn't embrace the, the law. They, they abused it. I mean, they used the law as a weapon of hate, but God intended it for the good of man. I mean, look at the, you, you think about these things that, that God put into the law when he gave it to Moses, and you think about the things that he put in there. Thou shalt not kill. That's a good idea. Thou shalt not steal. Another good idea. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's a really good idea. I, I mean, you get the point? I mean, the law is not there for our bad. The law is there for our good. And, and generally... We see it that way until we break it. And then all of a sudden we try to rationalize why we've done things. But not only did they hate the law, they were manipulators of the law. They used the law to get what they wanted. How many times have you ever had anybody come up to you and say, well, uh, you know, I know I did that and I probably shouldn't have done it, but I'm not near as bad as this person over here. You know, they did this or that or the other. Well, you know, th where that falls apart is that, that, that we're not being judged by somebody else. I mean, there are a lot of you people in here that are a lot, you know, less sinful than I am, but unfortunately, and maybe there's some that I'm, you know, less sinful than they are, but that's not where the bar is. Uh, the bar is our lives versus God's life. And can I tell you something else? The bar says, the, the, the bar, the level says that if you commit one sin, that you've fallen short of the glory of God. And you know what that is? That means death. One sin? Have I committed? How many of, can I just ask you a question by show of hands? How many in here, how many in this room have committed one sin or more? You're all dead. You're all dead. You're dead in your trespass and sin. <laughs> but thankfully, God loves you so much that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's the undeserving love that we see here in the passage. And, and do you know what? That they eventually used that law to kill the very one who had came to save them. Sad, isn't it? Well, they used it as a weapon of hate. They used it as, they were manipulators of the law. And, and not only were the religious leaders an enemy to the law, they were also an enemy to the woman. You know, these people that are supposed to love in a godly way took this woman and they used her, they used her as a pawn to destroy Jesus. They didn't care about this woman. They didn't want to rehabilitate her. They hated her. Hated what she stood for. They were below her. She didn't matter. Can I just tell you that it, she mattered to God? And she mattered to Jesus because I tell you Jesus in his actions showed that he loved her even though she had messed up in the midst of that crowd of hostile glaring accusing faces was this kind loving and compassionate friend Jesus the old world can be a hostile place but this new world that Jesus brings with him brings with him the idea that you may have messed up and I may not have liked what you've done but I'll still love you and I'll still care for you. And I'll still be on your side. Psalms have division 27 verse 3 says, Though a host encamp around me, my heart will not fear. Though war rise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. Why? Because God is with me. In Romans chapter 8 verse 31 in the King James Version, it says, What shall we say to these things? What do we say to these things? What things? Whatever the hardest problem you're going through is, whatever the damaging thing that's going on in your life right now, whatever is that, that you have done to mess up your life so bad that it looks like that there's no coming back from us, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? That's what we say. But I just lost my job. If God be for us, who can be against us? I just had adultery. I, I fell into it. I didn't mean for it to happen, and I've just messed everything up. My wife won't talk to me. My kids won't talk to me. God be with us. He'll be against us. Well, you don't understand, I, I, got, I got hooked on drugs. I'm an alcoholic. 
I'm a druggie. I've messed up. I stole some stuff. God, be for us. Who can be against us? Listen, we sin. There's payment for sin. Sometimes we get into some stuff. I also said, you know, if you cut your arm off, God's not going to grow it back. But he'll forgive you. And he'll still love you. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Don't be dismayed, for I am your God. I'll strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Those you search, those, though, though you search for your enemies, you'll not find them. Those who wage war against you will be nothing at all. Why? For I am the Lord, your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Don't fear, I will help you I'm an old country boy <clears throat> hadn't used Wooster in a long time I'll use it this morning it doesn't say I will help y'all it doesn't say I for you northerners I'll help youans it doesn't say that because we have a personal God we have a God that doesn't just love us collectively so that maybe the balance of everybody in here makes us good it says <laughs> that I Love, that's what it says. I am the Lord. Who's God? I want you to read that with me. And instead of the word you, uh, your, 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 <laughs> I want you to say the word my. And where it says, do not fear, I will help you, I want you to say me. Is that good? Can you do that with me? Listen, I know, I know it's hard. You know, we're working on two words here. But with, with, do it with me, okay? For I am the Lord, my God, who takes hold of my right hand and says to me, do not fear, I will help me. I know that doesn't work English-wise. <laughs> Listen, but I'll tell you, thank you, Chuck, but, but I will tell you this. It may not work grammatically, but it works wonders spiritually, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Listen, if you've had a bad week, if you've been on the spiritual battlefield, if you've fought the devil lately and you're beat up, uh, the, you know, <laughs> then you know how this woman feels. The religious leaders seem to have this woman and Jesus right where they wanted them. But with one amazing move, Jesus turned the tables and put the enemy on the run. Look what it says in verse 7. Let the one among you who is without sin cast the first stone. Listen, it's not saying that God's not against sin. It doesn't say that God doesn't hate sin, but it just does say, it, what it does say is that even though you've sinned, God still loves you. And guys, that's who we've got to be. I mean, the worst and the, 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 the baddest and the worst and the awfulest people in society do not deserve our hatred. Why? Because they're just like us. What do you mean they're like us? One sin or a thousand sins, we're all in the same boat. We were up on um, one of the mountains at Moab there. I think it may have been where we had the dinner, lunch one day, but we were driving along on this trail, really sandy trail, and it was beautiful, you know, mountains and, and buttes and arches and all these things. But where we were was not the prettiest place. It was just kind of an old dusty, sandy trail, and it was time for lunch. And uh, the guy that was leading our, our, uh, our little party there, he pulled over and said, here's where we're going to have lunch. And I was like, we're going to have lunch here? Is there not anything prettier that we can see than to have lunch here at this sandy place? And we walked up this on this rock that was about four foot off the trail, and we walked over here, and it was a thousand-foot drop. I tossed the rock off the side of it, and it took 11 seconds for the sound to come back up to where I could hear it. How deep is that? Some of you math majors tell me, but it's a long way. And we're standing there, and I'm talking with somebody, and I said, you know, you know, you can look across. I don't know how far it was. It might have been a half a mile. It might have been a quarter mile, but it was a long way to the other side. And I said, you know, you think about from where we stand to the other side. It's kind of like us saying that we're good enough to jump to the other side. You know, somebody might be a, a, an Olympic athlete, and they may be able to jump 35, 40 feet. I don't know what the world record is. But maybe me, because I have a fat belly and I'm old, maybe I could only make it two feet. At the end of the day, don't we both 
end up at the bottom of the ravine? Don't we both fall terribly short of getting to the other side? I'm not picking on you guys that have all this education. I, I, I envy you. But your, but, but, but your education will not get you to the other side. Your money will not get you to the other side. Everyone you know, short of Jesus Christ, will not get you to the other side. Now, you may brag about how much farther you jump from me as you fall a thousand feet. You got 11 seconds to brag. And the rest of eternity, you're in a mess. But can I tell you this? <laughs> when I jump off the cliff at the end of this old life, I'm not going to fall because my Jesus is going to take me clean to the other side. Because he loves me. And if you know him as personal Savior, he loves you too. John chapter 3, verse 1, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are. Second point, the love of Jesus is greater than the hatred of the Jews. Look back uh, with me, uh, John chapter 8, verse 4, second half of that verse, he says, uh, the Bible says, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? Notice how condescending the Jews are to Jesus, but watch what Jesus did. First, he does two great things. First, he makes them sweat. Notice what it says in verse 6. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Now, Jesus has already proven that he knows more than these people do. So when Jesus bends down and starts writing on the ground with his finger, we don't know what he wrote, but what he wrote must have been good. Maybe he wrote the name of somebody, one of those, one of those leading Jews. Maybe he wrote their name and put a dash and the woman he was having adultery with. We don't know. Maybe he drew stick figures. We don't know. But whatever he did, they started to sweat. Secondly, Jesus turns the table on them and makes the accusers become self-accusers. Jesus knew their hearts. All their secret sins were plain as day to Jesus. He said, if any one of you, any one of you great religious people are without sin, let him be the first one to throw a stone at her. I want you to see two striking truths in these verses right here. First, Jesus did not set aside the law. He did not look up at him, at those guys, and say, no, she didn't really sin. Adultery is not really a sin. It's, it's not a sin. No, it is a sin. It, it's clear that it's a sin. So Jesus didn't set aside the law. And the second thing Jesus did not do is he did not condone her sin. He merely said that if there's anyone here truly qualified to carry out the penalty for sin, let him do it. And none of them were qualified. Why? Because they'd all sinned. Listen, if you understand how bad that you are, or maybe you were before Christ, then, it, then it, uh, it does away with your ability to stand over and lord somebody and judge somebody. We simply judge somebody from the standpoint of, are they, you know, do they know Christ or do they not? And if you really, if you believe in their heart they don't believe Christ, then love kicks in. Not judgment, not penalty, not, not, not desertion, but love kicks in. And you come to that person, you walk along with that person, you help that person, not because you hate them, because you love them. Why do you love them? Because God first loved you. Now, I, I hope you understand this morning that sin's bad. God hates sin. I'm not trying to water that down. Uh, let me just tell you emphatically, in, in love, not, not, not judgmentally, because um, if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, if you've not asked him into your heart, then if you die in that condition, the Bible says that you're going to go to eternity to a place called hell. Anybody agree? Now, is that me being judgmental? Me telling the truth. And I'm trying to tell you the truth in love. So, God, you know, God didn't, he didn't condone sin. Um, and what I, I tell you something else. I was telling somebody this this week. If you're truly a Christian and you are sinning, and we know we all sin, we, can, we fall into sins and all that, don't make us perfect, but if you're, if you're, having, if you're having habitual sin in your life, God is going to do something to shake you up to try to get you to turn around from where you're going. Why? Because he loves you. 
you know, as a pastor and a Christian and a minister of the gospel, I'm telling you, it's my responsibility to tell you that without Christ and you die, you go to a place prepared for those people. If you accept Christ, then you go to a place that Christ has prepared for you. Of the two, can I just tell you that heaven's the place you want to be? Well, how do I get there? You simply accept the gift that God gave to you for that purpose. Why? Why do you do that? Because he loves you. How did I deserve that? You did it. Thirdly, the love of Jesus gives us victory, gives us victory over the hatred of the world. Now, in my notes, I put Satan, but I want you to understand that the world hates you. Uh, the world hates you. I was, I was watching uh, uh, John Hagee's uh, show this morning, and he was talking about this. There was a statistic that came on the TV screen that I just, I couldn't believe it. I don't know that it's true, but he put it up there as truth, and I got to believe, right? So of, of, of all the pregnancies that happen in the United States of America, not worldwide, United, this, this is what it said on television, so you can believe it what it's worth. Of all the children, of all the pregnancies in the United States of America, half are, um, uh, uh, what was it, unwanted, uh, unwanted. Well, they didn't, they, it was an accident, whatever. Of that half, of that half, of all the pregnancies in the United States of America, half of that, or quarter, are aborted. 25%, 1.3 million babies aborted in the United States of America. You think the world don't hate? You, you mess up. And watch the world pounce on you quickly. But look at this. John chapter 8, verse 9. At this, okay, what's just happened? They come up there, they accuse this woman. Jesus stoops down, begins to write on the ground. He looks up. He said, let, you with, let him that's without sin cast the first stone. At this, Jesus, now those who heard, began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman? Now, you girls that don't like to be called woman, Jesus said it. So when Cheryl comes along and I said, hey, woman, she gets mad at me? I'm just saying it's scriptural. Hmm. I'll be in trouble for that one. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Watch this. Oh, this is good. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and keep on sinning. Doesn't say that, does it, chick? <laughs> I, I like this. Jesus looks at her and says, go now and leave. I like the translation of the NIV. Go now and leave your life of sin. You know that when Jesus comes into our heart, we accept him as Savior. Jesus forms a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, the new is here. The new is the sinless you. We're still going to mess up. We're still going to make mistakes. But God doesn't see us that way. I mean, can you just hear the tenderness in his voice? Sweet lady, where are they? Has nobody condemned you? I mean, did you ever think about the fact that the same blood that washed your sins away is the same blood that paid for hers? The same thing that Jesus said to that woman is the same thing that he's saying to you and me today. You're not condemned. I love you. You don't have to live that way anymore. If you're saved and you still mess up a lot, can I just tell you, you don't have to live that way anymore. God is stronger than your Sin. Jesus is saying, I'm offering you a better way. I'm almost done. In, in this whole passage, we see on one side, we see the mercy, or you could argue the grace, where he says, neither do I condemn you. But then we also see the command. Now go. But leave your life of sin. Don't do it that way anymore. You know, how many of us, <laughs> when, when squeezed, when pressured, when given adversity, we act the same way every time? And it always turns out bad. How, how many of you, when you get angry, you, you lash out? Does that work for you? How many of you, I could just go through a list, but, but how many of you do something that's damaging when you get pressured? 
it don't work out. But Jesus said, I don't condemn you either. Now why don't you try my way? Why don't you try turning the other cheek? Why don't you try leaving your burdens at the foot of the cross? Why don't you try understanding that I'm close to you and I'll not forsake you, I'll not leave you? Why, when, when you're feeling the loneliest in your life, why don't you say, oh, man, I'm sure glad God's next to me because if he wouldn't, I don't know what I'd do. There's something that you have inside of you that the world does not. I mean, Jesus never merely excuses sin. He doesn't condone it. He never takes a place for it. He never rationalizes it. But he does encourage you and he commands you to leave that old life. Romans chapter 6 verse 1, uh, the apostle Paul said, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And then he says, By no means. We, that's Christian people, say that with me. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24, the Bible says, He himself, talking about Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die <laughs> To sins and live for righteousness by his wounds you've been healed hey, listen to me for one more minute I'm done I'm down at the part of my sermon where it says invitation so we're gonna buckle this up you are not the only one that knows that you're a sinner all those sins that are secret to everybody else your workmates, your friends, your spouse, your kids. Jesus also knows those sins. Well, that makes me feel real good. Let me ask you this. Of anyone in the world, if you had the choice that could know your sins, Jesus would be the one. Because Jesus knows your sins and he still loves you. Because Jesus knows your sins and he doesn't condemn you. Because Jesus knows your sins and he stands ready to heal you. Because Jesus knows your sins and he is by your side for you to get better from what you've messed yourself up into. Jesus knows that I'm a sinner. That's a fact. But his love for me overcomes his hatred toward sin. One of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. Every time I'm witnessing to somebody... I use this verse. For God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed as our praise team comes and prepares itself for this time. Listen, I'm done. But I'm just praying right now that the Holy Spirit would just grow big inside of us right now. If there's something inside of your life that's causing you to have, um, that's, that's causing you to have a defeated life, that's causing you to think that no one loves you, that's causing you to think that you just will never be worth anything, right now is the time to say, oh, I know that God loves me. Maybe, maybe you're here this morning and you'll step out from, the, uh, from, from where you are. And you'll come to the front, to this altar, and you'll grab a prayer partner by the hand and you'll say, pray with me because I don't think anybody loves me. And they'll talk to you. They'll pray with you about the love of God. Maybe there's someone here this morning that has never taken the opportunity to give their life to Jesus and surrender their life to the God that loves them so much. Maybe Jesus is saying to you this morning, neither do I condemn you. Come on now and leave your life of sin. Maybe there's somebody here this morning that's just kind of floating out in life and needs somewhere that they can connect. Maybe you need to join this church this morning. Maybe you need to follow him in baptism. Maybe you need to make it right with somebody this morning. Maybe there's something going on in your family that you need to connect with your spouse. Whatever it is this morning, you understand that we know what love is because we can watch how God loved other people. So this morning, however the Holy Spirit is working on you this morning, would you push everything else aside? And would you just take this moment with God?